Welcome to the Science of Beers podcast with me, Mick Mickey. Talking science and drinking beers with researchers down at the pub. We cover a new topic each episode, so join us with a brew and let's cheers to science. I have two guests this week. Uh, we have Professor Ian Woodward, who is a cultural sociologist, as well as Sina Bang, a PhD researcher and market anthropologist. And they are both based at the Faculty of Business and Social Science at the University of Southern Denmark. So we're going to get into talk about uh, their research project. Uh, if you want to know more about the research project, it is funded by European Union's Horizon 2020 program about public spaces, culture and integration in Europe. It's also funded and administered by HERA, the Humanities in European Research Area. I will, I will link to the project website in the description so you can read a little bit more. But uh, here is Ian and Sina to tell you a little bit about it. Hope you enjoy. All right. Sina and Ian, thank you very much for joining me on the Science of Beers podcast. Cheers. Cheers. Skål. We have three glasses of delicious yeah. Kiss Mayer, an anarchist beer. Mm. Mm. We are sitting just a, a hundred meters away from the main stage of Generator Festival, where we should have been having a live podcast with an audience, and we would have been talking about uh, the impact of coronavirus on music festivals in 2020. The festival itself was cancelled because of coronavirus. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here we are, we're sitting in the student house in Oanza. Um, as they clean up the festival that never was, so, guys, we should have been at a festival. Yeah. How, as academics studying festivals, were you excited to be actually part of the program of a festival? Definitely. Yeah, it would have been really cool to actually talk about uh, music festivals at a music festival. That's yeah, a bit of an ultimate goal. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and I guess <laughs> also been fun. in this special situation to see, I think, what generator was up to was in itself quite interesting uh these uh being a seated festival with space like uh trying to with social distancing and different means in place i think that would also have been quite interesting from our perspective to be part of there really haven't been many festivals especially uh, festivals focusing on say electronic music this year uh the, the poor people behind it they put in a lot of work uh for the past few, few months to try and get it together and they found out 12 hours before it was meant to start that uh, suddenly the the number of people infected with coronavirus here in Owens uh, just mm. b boomed up to 36 and so they were shut down so, so my, my heart really goes out to those people yeah but let's let's go back BC before corona oh. put it into context what were you guys what, what were you interested in in 2019 with regards to music festivals in 2019, in regards to music festivals, or be, be, we, we before, were, we, before the, the great pandemic. Corona, yeah, I mean, we were interested in carrying out the project as we described. So we won a grant for the project, or I won a grant with a, four other people, I think, from uh, from European universities. This is the Festiversities. Correct. Project. Yeah, it's uh, this is the acronym Festiversities, but it's about uh, uh, European music festivals, public space, and cultural diversity. So it's really about festivals as a type of public space in European settings. So in 2019, we were uh, we were employing people. We were getting excited. We were we were developing partnerships with big festivals. We were talking to the organisers. We were developing a whole series of collaborations. We were meeting to, to specify all of our uh, techniques of data collection. So yeah, 29 was a good, 2019 was a good year, busy year, and it was an optimistic year in relation to the project. We were we were out there and uh, very active in terms of working out exactly what we're going to do. I mean, part of that is that um, we did have a very clear plan. So you, to, to win money, you have to have good people and you have to have a good plan. So we had a clear plan and then the, the goal is to execute the plan. So we were preparing to do that. And uh, of course, then it was thrown into disarray early, through the early months of uh, 2020 as it became obvious, clear, eventually, that uh, there's probably going to be no festivals. We were 
we were originally hoping, keeping our fingers crossed, that, that um, you know, first thought is that, uh, yeah, by, by July, August, September, this should be okay. But, um, you yeah, know, that was way too optimistic, obviously. We, we have no understanding of the processes. So, uh, yeah, 2020 has been a year of uh, re-evaluation, I guess. Can, 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 we, can we just clarify again, what were the, what were the, the aims or the questions of the Festive Diversities project? I don't have all the questions on me at the moment, but, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the main, the main aim is this. I mean, the assumption is this, um, that, that music festivals are such ubiquitous spaces of cultural consumption these days. They are more pop, they're seemingly more popular and there's seemingly more of them. And that not just music festivals, there's seemingly more festivals. So, that, so this is part of the background is that, um, is that the festival becomes a way for people to be in public space and a way for people to belong to communities and a way for people to be, be, have a certain social identity which becomes visible. So the question of the project is, um, across multiple European settings, um, in what ways do festivals create public spaces which are um, uh, important, productive, useful spaces for civic belonging? Given that they are so popular, given that people invest so much time and money and effort into them, what do they do for our societies and what do they, what do, they do for our culture? That's the sort of the broad question that the project, um, the project attempts to answer, I guess. I mean, the other part of our project too is, is about the power of music. I mean, music has got this capacity to excite, to bring large collectives of people together um, and to vibrate with bodies in, in, in these spaces of festivals. And that, what's, that's what makes them so exciting. So music, the power of music is, um, is also a part of this project. Um, well, so we have some musicologists in the project. I can certainly feel, feel for that. You yeah. Know, yeah. It's music, music has the power to like, make you weak at the knees, to make the, the hair stand up in your yeah. arms and goosebumps in the back of your neck. Correct. Um, and then whenever you experience that music, also you can, you can hear a song a hundred times, but the, 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 you can hear it in, in a certain setting and you can just get it, you can get it. Yeah. But it doesn't make any sense that you've got it. It just makes... No. It just hits you, no, no. hits you right in the heart. You're not going to forget that. It's co-presence. Yeah, right. it's really, it's really experiencing that with other people who are also focused on that. And and for us, at least the the method that we use, we need to bring our bodies into it mm -hmm. to get it, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. So powerful experience. So the powerful part of this experience is transcendence. How do people reach this state in which they're able to transcend, almost feel as if they're be moving beyond and moving and feeling beyond the, the mundane, the everyday, their own bodies and so on, and connecting directly with others? Mm -hmm. Music then becomes a sort of a conduit for that because it excites emotion, it excites the body, it vibrates, there are lyrics, there are stories to be told, and there's a performer doing this stuff. So it's sort of a, a, human, a human response. Mm -hmm. But it's also in the context of the, of the festival space, special space, out of, out of time and place. So... This is also partly explaining its power. And then the, the question for us is, what does this do for us? What does it do for society? How does it matter down the line? Mm -hmm. Yeah, why does this one week or one weekend or three days? Yeah. Because it, maybe it, it, it increases the likelihood of finding that, that experience, that transcendent experience. You can, tr you can try and plan for those events. I've, try, I've tried myself to try to, to do something that would yeah. manufacture it. It's impossible. No. No, that's the feeling. It's got to be done. It's got to come authentically, organically, mm -hmm. as people talk about, and it's got to feel real. And then, if it feels real, then it has power. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is part of the trick, and I guess that's why people buy festival tickets in the hope that they will have these type of transcendent experience. Part of the promise is you're away from ha you're away from home. You're in a special space. You're in a meaningful space. So maybe the chances are increased for that type of transcendent experience. If I go to a Bruce Springsteen concert, I'm going to I'm going to be in tears. I will be, you know, moved beyond. Uh, yeah, so that's that's, like, that's that's your capacity. That's, <laughs> that, that speaks to your uh -huh. uh, desire to be in touch with the sacred. Bruce, correct. <laughs> <laughs> correct. So I guess that's it, always a partly just finding the sacred. Partly just finding the sacred. Some, sometimes people plan to find it, like the Springsteen, or sometimes people just find it accidentally. Um, mm. So, mm. so I guess that's that's part of the interesting question is what are the what are the arrangements that need to happen for people to find this type of uh, sacrality um, emerge out of seemingly nothing, uh, or do, do people have to? Plan?
plan it and, and put a lot of effort into finding and so on. Mm. So and maybe Bruce Springsteen will always be sacred for you, no matter in what yeah. context you're experiencing him. Mm. But for others, it might take like the stars and moons and whatever to be in the right. Yeah. yeah. And, and festivals plan for that, obviously, yeah, trying right. yes. to create. That's what they want. They that's a good way of putting it. That the stars and the moon has to have to align. To, to yeah, they they want this yeah. stuff. They, they want you know people to return if they find these sort of magical experiences. Uh -huh. A good example is that the many festivals will have what they call an atmosphere team. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're gonna have a Huge team on yeah. the festival just to create atmosphere, yeah. and they yeah. try that out in different ways and perfect and do stuff. I mean, that's I think that's a really good example of uh, that they're they're intentionally trying to create this alignment quote yes. unquote yeah, exactly. of the stars and moons and whatever <laughs> exactly. yeah exactly i mean the third thing we can't forget is that people there are teams behind all of this yeah designing these experiences in a lot of places uh, people's very appearance the clothes that they choose to buy uh, even their behavior can be influenced by the music you yeah. know think of uh, Coben Hell, the heavy metal festival. There's a lot of black. There's a lot of long hair. There's there's a lot of piercings. You know, there's a definitely. I hate to use the word typical, but 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 there's a certain look that goes yeah. along with with a genre of music there. So so I guess that that, that touches into what you're talking about in identity, uh, how people see their themselves. Yeah, and yeah I, I think that's partly right. I mean, festivals also allow us to congregate, or music festivals, and allow us to some degree to congregate with people that we feel certain types of social or cultural affinities with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so big mega festivals have a variety of musics, but then you, you mentioned the example of Copenhagen, which is this metal fest. So, um, you know, you're not going to go along to Copenhagen unless you're really into metal uh, or, or the varieties of metal music, presumably. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, part of part of the assumption of, of, of music festivals is that they bring people of like-minded um, musical sensibilities. That's why they're that's why they're partly successful because people are like wow, look at the array of brilliant metal acts. Look at the folk acts I'm gonna gonna see over this weekend. You know, for other people, couldn't care less. So, so this sort of music, these musical tastes, um, do help us um, affiliate, if you like, with people that we imagine we are. But like, on the other hand. There's also the possibility at many festivals to to be inspired and to have acquire new tastes. Yeah. Um, and whether it might be a friend pulling you onto a new festival with a taste of music you perhaps haven't quite gotten or understood yet, or you just like one band and you figure out okay, there's a variety of bands. Or so so it, festival spaces are also spaces of of actually uh, learning and. Yeah. Um, Acquiring new tastes. Uh, yeah. I think it, all everyone have been at a festival where suddenly you hear something and you're like, "What's that thing over there?" It might not have been on your schedule list of acts that you planned on attending, but you end up at a at a different crowd than you thought you'd be, and suddenly you find your Spotify playlist changed when yeah. you come back home. I mean, this is right. So we, I mean, we and Cena, I remember talking to people about this. This is one of the very exciting things about festivals is. Um, that you allow yourself to be taken to some degree, so you surrender almost to the experience. This is a positive way for some people to experience the festival. They might have an agenda, but they might get lost, they might get distracted, they might listen to something that's like, wow, I didn't plan on coming here, but this has blown my mind. Why has it blown your mind? Because it's partly about the surprise element. So mm, that's why people like festivals as well. If we pay, pay 500 krona to go and see a gig in Copenhagen, we know what we're gonna get for the next two and a half hours. But with the festival, uh, there's also this opportunity for experimentation. So this is also maybe why some people uh, enjoy it. But as Sina said, it's also one of the things that gives open possibility of the festival as a type of experimenting space. Yeah. There seems to be different rules as well from society into a festival. I'm remembering maybe back to my younger days, uh, going to, uh, say, Ross, Ross killed the festival and uh, the amount of people that are... You know, I don't know, lying face down in the dirt, wearing a, a tiara in the morning, uh, or people, people just dressed the way they would never be able to, to dress in walking down the streets, and mm. it's just normal. It's mm. just absurd, crazy behaviour is normal at a, yeah. at a festival like Roskilde, and to a lesser extent, Tinderbox. So there's this, uh, there's this. I was talking to you before this podcast of like the, the, the hedonistic uh, opportunities at a, at a festival seems to be 
attracting a, a certain yeah certain i mean that's one of, of the be the beauties of the space i guess also creates some problems but it's one of the beauties of the space is that uh yeah, maybe people feel less judged. Maybe people feel able to act in ways which is completely hedonistic or, or indulgent with uh, with themselves or with others and so on. So maybe, yeah, this is this is certainly one of the attractions that you can completely you know let loose for a week or five days or whatever, um, and not be judged around it, so to speak. So no, certainly, yeah, this is this is important. Yeah, meeting meeting like-minded, open people. Mm -hmm. Whether yeah, that be a, a certain way of dressing or a certain mood or whatever you feel that you have in common of openness in this space. I, I talked to a lot of young teens and, and the the trip to Roskilde. It, it, they almost describe it like it's a pilgrimage. You know, it, it's something that everybody does whenever they're eighteen to, to twenty, and uh, you know. It's something that's looked forward to. It costs a lot of money, and it, it's a, like out of seven or nine days or something like it's that. It's quite an endurance. It's too. really, really something it's, else. Um, so. At least as an anthropologist, you read about these uh, rites of passage in the books about some hut somewhere, uh, where you really have to endure some tests to figure out if you're up for it. And as you describe Oskibe, right? It's it's really it's a week of heavy drinking and also of, of actually being in a confined space. I mean, you compared it to a Tinderbox Festival and Tinderbox Festival is quite different in the sense that you go home every night uh, into your own bed. You have a proper shower, most likely. Of course, there's a camping option, but it's not, this, it's not the same space as Roskilde where you stay and you endure this for a week and you live among these other people who are also enduring it for a week. Mm -hmm. So it is definitely some sort of uh, ritual to it. And of course, festivals differ in the way that people uh, do it. Good. Yeah, I mean, and also what you what you observe at the beginning is that the journey is is just as important as the as this the gig or, or the bands that you see. So the stuff around the music is is just as important as as listening to the music. You know, as as you as seen or observed, um, you know, it's um, it it, become, it becomes this rite of passage based around this holistic. This holistic experience rather than simply just it's way beyond going to a gig yeah twenty twenty comes along the big music festivals are shut down society's you know affected uh, you know humongously <laughs> to, yeah. to, to see uh, not to take anything, anything away from it, like that. There, there's a there's a pandemic that's killing people, and uh, there's a reason, there's a good reason why why these uh, mass sure. gatherings were were cancelled. But how has that affected your work? <laughs> Where should we start? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, okay, the formal st the formal story, and then maybe Cena can pick it up, and we can we can go from there. But I mean, the formal story is that we we work we work with a whole series of fairly typical. Um, uh, methodologies in social science, surveys, uh, ethnographic, ethnographic observation, interviews, and we would be asking people about a whole range of aspects of their, to use the concept, cultural consumption of the festival. And we would be following them through the festival, we would be talking to them before and after, you know, um, so a whole series of fairly typical ways that you could go about measuring aspects of um, the experience of preparing, being at, and then thinking about the festival after. So it's fairly you know, and, and quite an extensive data collection phase um, was planned. Yeah. And then Corona hit. Boom. Yeah, exactly. So what do we what do? We, do? we, we were just sitting we the night. We can't the project. I think it was April, early April press conference. And you could just see on social media how the cancellations would roll in on Facebook and Instagram, all the festivals. And you sit there and you read through it and you need to make sense of it and figure out, okay, what do we do now? So I think it was the week after, I started calling some of the people I've been in touch with already, festival goers, asking, so what are you doing now? Are you keeping your ticket? How do you think about the prospect of this summer without festivals? Uh, so I think that was some of the initial reaction for, from our research project, figure out what are people actually thinking about this? Because as you said, they're quite uh, very reasonable um, for these cancellations. Uh, um, and then the next step was really then, as I said, scrolling through social media, figuring out what's up and down in this. Are there some commonalities in the way people react and also in the way that the festival organizers mm. are reacting? Yep. So I think that would be 
like the first phase of, okay, Corona's here, it's for real. Uh, it's, this is affecting our research and of course the festival's big deal. Yep. And then kind of as the festivals then started happening, and I say started happening because people are actually sometimes still referring to during festival time, like when a, a, whenever a festival will be approaching, let's say the, the dates of Roskilde were supposed to happen mm -hmm. or the dates that uh, Tuna Festival was supposed to happen as just this previous weekend. We started to see how not only the festival organizers, but also those who were supposed to attend the festivals started to uh, do a lot of uh, things. And these are uh, a big array of different events, like bigger, smaller. Uh, I don't know if we should mention our partners, of course. Uh, we are working together with Distortion Festival mm -hmm. and Heartland Festival and Turnout Festival. So those are the ones we are keeping closest eye on. Um, so examples of what happened during those days were, for instance, for Heartland, they made a pick up a flower bouquet at uh, Esco Castle. Yeah, so people could come and pick up this uh, flower bouquet that were they were supposed to decorate, of course, the festival with all these flowers that they yeah. uh, it's quite, it's last quite a, year. It's quite a nice story. So they sow the fields at the end or during the festival the previous year with these beautiful wildflowers, and then they expect them to be blooming during the festival the following year. Yes, to then be okay. able to pick to them and decorate I did, I did the festival space. Yeah. So that was one uh, example of an initiative that they did. They also made some small pre-recorded, very nice produced uh, concerts with some select um, artists. So that's something Heartland did. But then on the other side, you also see uh, Heartland festival goers then taking matters into their own hands. Uh, I've talked to some who made uh, their own little festival space, created their own banners, uh, having making their own take on what Heartland Festival means in their area, uh, creating a festival program, even festival bracelets of their own. So these small initiatives mm. we've seen for not only the festivals we're uh, currently engaged with, yeah. but actually throughout the festival season, you could see every time a festival was held or was supposed to be held, when you came to, uh, to the canceled dates, mm -hmm. so to say, you could see these different initiatives, whether those be online, uh, in a smaller scale, in a physical space, or and then also, of course, the uh, festival goers. Mm. Exactly. So it's like... Um, what and then, of course, we started following those. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can tell more in a sec, but I mean, what's that, what's that about? I mean, we, we, think it's a, we think it's really a, a desire to keep the festival alive or keep the festival's essence or spirit alive but in these sort of uh, post-corona or during corona spaces. So it's a phase of sort of remaking or re-spatializing or rematerializing the festival. Can't go ahead on the site that it usually is, but let's do something to at least remember it and to at least carry on its spirit uh, in, a, in, a, in a safe way, let's say. A lot of people would say, actually, literally, right. well, I already marked off the weekend or the week. I'm, yeah. I'm, I have time off. Yeah, let's do something. It will be, exactly. Mm -hmm. We yeah. can't just do nothing. Yeah. Like, I remember whenever Tinderbox was meant to happen? Yes. It was hard, hard to sleep actually because the, the, the house parties. Right. I uh, went out to Tooth North Scone to see, because I'm like, okay, it's the festival space. It's an open green area. I wonder if people are out there. I live in Windsor, so it's a sh short little bike ride. And I came out and first of all, when you approach the field, if you've been to f Tinderbox, you see the entrance area and a banner was ha hung. I don't even know by who, but some sort of banner um, memorializing uh, tinderbox was hung and I went over this little type of hill that goes up to the uh, entrance mm -hmm. and then you start seeing small groups a little bit two girls over there putting glitter in each other's faces listening to music then you see a big group of, of youngsters over here mm -hmm. and they all have matching bracelets and they've made like a little uh, a range of games they have like a little tournament of sorts then you see an old, a, a group of old guys, like 10 old guys sitting, having their rosé wine. And so, so you saw these scattered small groups doing something on the festival space. Mm. Wow. It's, it's like, that, that's, uh, that's really kind of, yeah. It's, what's the word? <laughs> Honoring the festival in, in, yes. in, a, in a strange way? Correct. It so the festival really had a lot of meaning for those people if they went to the, yeah. to the lengths of making themselves a, a fake armband. Ah, and well, and well beyond that, yeah. well beyond the armband thing, there are lots and lots of little things like that that they did, yes, which, so which you would consider really unusual. Actually, later the same day, I was invited to a uh, garden party, uh, also a mini festival, 
and they had made their again their own little usually what people actually do when they have their own uh, mini version of whatever festival they are honoring or celebrating they will uh, create a little spin to the name and then uh, make their own they also made their own bracelets and they make different uh, areas around this little garden uh, so for instance they had the magic box they put uh -huh. up a little uh, swimming pool like children's swimming pool and that was the magic box area uh -huh. and so on so in that sense uh, people uh, recreate a lot of the things from the festival mm. which is also from our research quite interesting then to see uh, this sense of of course we're talking with the organizers the organizers of course have a vision for what the festival usually is what they want it to be like in the future mm. but suddenly we're seeing uh, these festival goers taking it in their own hands. Right. Like they're literally, they tell about how they're literally, okay, it's, it's canceled. Then they sit down, we have to do something. And then they start planning, okay, what do we need? Like mm -hmm. for instance, now we were in Turner um, and they told how they sat down and wondered what should we have at the festival space here in our garden. And they talked about how they would sit and then think about these different elements and um, Unlike other festivals, Turner Festival is comprised of tent stages mm -hmm. rather than these big open air stages as we know from, for instance, uh, Tinderbox. Um, so they have decided to make several tent stages. So they have rented a party tent and called that Tent One. That's like the biggest tent on the festival usually. Then they had a small uh, pavilion type of tent that was Tent Two. And these types of things they uh, mm. try to recreate and and that, that, that's so interesting because at any point of the year you could do that. You exactly. know? Yeah, but, you but, could. But, but people say it means much more to them whenever it's associated with a, exactly. with a festival. And exactly. they also they go an extra effort mm. to do something <laughs> special about it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, as you say, it could have happened any time of year, but it, but it also points to the temporal importance of festivals through the calendar. You know, so um, so it is at the height of summer or the end of summer and so on. So this sort of temporality is important. Um, to people, um, and I guess that also points like, yeah, we know we know the festival is due to be this weekend. We're going to experience a, a whole sense of emptiness if we don't do something with our friends who are usually here in Tuna this weekend. So it's partly its reaction to sort of um, so, so to deal with that sense of um, of loss a little bit. I think well, that that word emptiness is is a is an interesting one. So so that, that would apply that. that it's probably the first time I've used it in relation to our study. <laughs> Maybe you have, I'm not sure. Well, but I think I have a lot of people describing yeah. emptiness, yeah. as yeah. we just talked about. Yeah. Maybe you've taken a full week off from work and you had set what you were to spend this time on. Yeah. And you usually spend that time on it every year. Well, then it's bound to be empty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, if that doesn't happen, then it causes, yeah, I mean, maybe it causes some relative upset, you mm -hmm. know, to people. Um, it's not the end of their world, but they also feel as though they need to recover that, recover from that feeling in some way, maybe. maybe but I think maybe that emptiness is also then what drives people to then go the mile and right. arrange a mini festival in their backyard or, mm. or whatever kind of initiatives they feel to compensate or to honor this, yes. to not just dwell in this emptiness. Yeah, exactly. So it, at the bottom line, it really points to the, the, the relative, like, the foundational sort of importance of the festival in people's leisure calendars, but also in their fa in their family and friend calendars. Yes, so I had <laughs> actually the, over this weekend. I had multiple talk people talking to people about Turner Festival who said, "My family knows that they can't invite me for anything this time of the year, this weekend, this particular week, because I'll be at Turner Festival." Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. they just know that, as you said, it's structuring even families' calendars yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And then, so people had time, at least, to plan what they're going to do instead of the Tuna Festival. Yes. But the, the, the poor people that were scheduled to be at Generator listening to us on stage this very moment, <laughs> they, they didn't, don't really have time to, to do anything that's, to substitute. The that's the, tra that's the tra relative tragedy of this occasion, yeah, is that there was no warning, so to speak. Uh, it was planned, the equipment's here, the setup materials are here. It's all waiting to be set up, but it's sort of sad that it can't. On the um, other hand, I, I've also heard some for the festivals that were cancelled well in advance that now suddenly they have opened up their calendars again. They might have moved 
they are holidays now, so okay, they have work anyways, or mm. a confirmation might have been moved, so now they actually have to spend it on that. Mm. Whereas I could imagine easily also this weekend, now that we have some, suddenly people have a free weekend. Mm. They may have some girlfriends or guys that they were to hang out with. And what are we doing Saturday night? Well, come to my place. Yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised this weekend if we, uh, uh, if we hear you know, on the streets that people <laughs> are, are still celebrating somehow. It might not be as, uh, uh, as well planned out or scheduled as some of these uh, no. turnout events, for instance. No. But I could definitely imagine that. So, so partly, yeah, this is, this is about remembering. I mean, maybe there are commercial interests in it for festivals. But but more more important, equally important at least, this sort of symbolic remembrance, right? To, to make sure that it stays in our minds, in our hearts, and so on. Given that it is so, it is such an important event in the calendar for various reasons. Yeah. So yeah, this remembrance dimension I think has been important this year. This honouring, maybe as you, as we've said. Yeah. So it, it it sounds very positive the the stories you have about the people trying to recruit their own festivals, but. Did your, your questioning also find people that are a little bit nervous and, and really skeptical about getting into a large gathering of people because they're they're genuinely anxious about yeah, catching but, corona? I mean, we, we half expected that we might see people um, on the festival fields of these festivals that we were visiting, but we we didn't. Generally, maybe 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 a few in tinner box and so on, but. But but not so many in the other examples that we've been following. Mm. So, but I guess if you go to the actual ground of the festival, you're going to find enthusiasts there. It's the people that uh, that are still in their in their apartments and don't want to come out that are still anxious about the sure. The, the, I mean, the virus. and and they of, would also be part of the of they were part we of the festival committee last year. Been somewhat seeking out those doing something interesting. Some mm, yep. people have, of course, also just refunded their ticket or. Yeah transferred it to next year, yeah. waiting until yeah, next year, exactly. or intending a confirmation or whatever would then fall into their calendar. Yep. Um, so of course that too. So you, you, you both published uh, an article called the COVID, co in brackets, vid creation yeah. of music festivals. And you were drawing attention really to, to how it has affected the Festiversities uh, uh, project. Um, and in the article, you, you brought in the, the metaphor of rain. rain. Not even a metaphor. Not like even a metaphor. Also okay. a, metaphor, a metaphor, but mm. actually also rain. Yeah. Rain as a something that pours down from the sky and suddenly you have to deal with it. Uh -huh. You have to deal with it like, will my tent survive? Will all mm -hmm. my stuff get wet? Will I have wet feet? Will my rain boots keep me out and then of course the organizers will i have a super muddy field like yep. it's um i'm sorry if you had a question prepared <laughs> 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 uh, the question was supposed to elaborate it's, on, it's, on, it's the, like a, on the article yeah. Yeah. it's a random it's so a it, random it's, it's agent also, it's a it's I an mean, agent it's a metaphor but it's also as a as a thing yeah. pouring yeah. down from the sky that you have to deal with and that fundamentally changes the way you experience and make the festival Yep. Um, and also something that a lot of times the festivals have to adapt to as they go along. Okay, will we have a sunny week or will we have a rainy week? We don't mm. know. Mm. And the reason for drawing on this analogy of, of rain as a metaphor, but also as, a, as an object pouring down from the sky, is that COVID-19 in a sense have been this to the festival. Suddenly you have this invisible thing around us in the festival space and you mm. need to take account for it. Mm. Is very new and exotic, you could say, compared to rain. Festivals have been, and festival goers have been prepared for rain for a yeah. lot of years. They can enjoy it as well. Some, they can also enjoy it, yes, yeah. but it, it's, it's character a, building. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a part Correct. of the festival for better part or for worse. Yep. And suddenly you have this new, and that's the pointing back to this sense of COVID creation, in that whenever you're establishing a festival, whether that be from the participant side that you're establishing these experiences, or from the organizer side you are co-arranging with all these things around you. So that could be the woods of Scannable. It could be Tusnoskone of Tinderbox. It could be that flat field of yeah. Turner or the streets of Copenhagen for distortion. But you might also have rain or you might have sunshine. Or in this case, you have COVID-19. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and COVID-19 is a little bit different from rain. And that's mm. kind of what I guess we're, everybody yeah. is yeah. coping with and learning how 
to mm -hmm. live with and co-organize with this Correct. year. Correct. So then, then organizers, audiences, festivals need to take account of uh, COVID into the, near, into the near future um, as, as an active agent yeah. in the way in which they organize their events. If, if the festival generator was to happen, the one we, we were meant to be a part of, they were taking a lot of precautions. It was uh, limited capacity at different venues. It was uh, hand spread everywhere and, and seated uh, one meter apart. Mm, you know, mm. so, so they were really, really prepared. And if it wasn't for uh, the overnight rise in Corona cases, the, the festival would still happen. So there was... Yes, and they have, I think they're a really um, strong example of co-creating with COVID-19 yep. mm -hmm. because uh, we also just had a chance to have a brief, brief chat with the uh, organizer a second ago. Tina. Tina. Yeah. Again, talking about how they have constantly been in touch with uh, authorities to figure out a way to do this festival Corona mm -hmm. safely, right? Yep. Yep. And that is really uh, yep. a great instance of co-organizing. And that's, yep. of course, the interesting question for how long will we be co-organizing with yep. Corona? Yeah, correct. Well, if you're listening in the year 2025 and we're, we're still, uh, still no festivals, um, you, gonna, you have the answer to that. You know the answer. <laughs> I mean, what, what will happen next year exactly, and how I do think... festivals think about what they can do? Because, I mean, talking to festivals, uh, the people who are organizing them and making them, we, we know that they have to start planning early. You know, they have to start a year ahead or nine months ahead um, to or make. You, you would book your artists at least a year in advance. Exactly, and then you've got to then if you're booking artists, you've got to be working around numbers. You've got to be working around ticket prices. You've got to then be working around the, the type of spaces you need. So for them, it becomes a difficult set of questions about how they how they play it for next year. I think, you know, is it going to be the same model, or can they bank on it being the same model that it was back in nineteen? Uh, do they need to come? Up, with new models, probably not the same as 19, uh, not not this close to the pandemic, and even if it's disappeared somehow, or mostly disappeared by, by summer next year. Um, It'll also be fresh in everyone's memory. Correct. That's the thing. I think when we, in in April, had all these refunded tickets, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone was, and our, ourselves included, or at least myself, <laughs> was thinking there will be a return of the festival as we know it next year, right? right. We'll ride this off. I think now and also I think I think Generator and, and other smaller festivals uh, are great examples of really um, this late summer innovations. Okay, Corona is actually still around. Mm -hmm. What can we do? What can we do within these limits of what is safe? Okay, social distancing. So far, seated concerts seems to have been uh, key or at least uh, uh, assigned mm. seats. Yep. Uh, that you're maybe not going to the bar yourself, but somebody will bring your beer to you. All these small types of initiatives. Maybe also you will see masks being part of the. So that's the mm -hmm. that's the uh, reality as it is right now. And of course, neither me, Ian, or I can know what will be gone going on next year. But at least I think we could, you could, um, you could think of maybe this late summer innovations as perhaps uh, yep. some of the tools at least that festivals could be working around for the future. Correct. I mean, I, I don't see a problem with wearing, wearing masks. You know, if you want to come to a festival, everybody wears a mask. Is that... Yeah, as long as you can drink and breathe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, that's right. So people, people can accept, people can learn or, or mm. adapt their behaviors or modify their behaviors to accept that. If the festival is important, if seeing this band is important, hanging with, yeah, then maybe, maybe people learn to accept that, at least in the short term, that things definitely can't be the same. So yeah, Sina's right. There's, so there's a there's a sort of a, a change that has to happen about how we think about our bodies, our social bodies in space, and how we how these are monitored in relation to other people. Given that the virus can still be around, we need to reassess um, assess and, our sociality. But I also think this year's um, responses to the cancel festivals, all these initiatives by festival goers and by the organizers, these alternative ways of uh, celebrating the festival, I think have proven that they're not just going to go away. Mm -hmm. It's not, okay, let's say the pandemic is full on next year too. Hopefully not. <laughs> but let's say it is. I, I really don't think there'll ever be a scenario where the festivals and their uh, festival goers will just give up, just plan out, say, okay, mm -hmm. we lost it. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to, to be such a willpower to do something. 
mm-hmm. whether that be these uh, corona initiatives, <coughs> corona friendly initiatives or pandemic friendly yep. initiatives by the organizers, yep. or even those doing the garden party things. I asked those guys who were talked about, told you about from Turner, what about next year? And their first response would be, we'll support the festival, we'll be full on. And then I gave them a little bit more of a serious look and they said, well, if it's also canceled next year, then I guess we'll have to do this again, pointing yep. to this tent that we were sitting in while we yep. had the conversation. Yep. So there seems to be a willpower to power through. There's something in our core that likes to get together and have exactly. a good time. Right, so... <laughs> yeah, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> and this is a good one. Ah. Mm. Was it heaven? And I, I, love the, I love the logo. Blue moon. Blue moon. Good. So whenever I was I was uh, a student trying to figure out my, my career path, uh, the careers counselor was talking about you know biology or things that I was good at. He never he never actually said that you know if you wanted to work yeah. in, at music festivals uh, as an academic you could pursue that. Hmm. So so for me this this it, it is it is fascinating that uh, that there are, are people addressing the questions the academic questions what how important are music festivals. For the community, for a sense of identity, what do we miss whenever we don't have any festivals? How did you guys get into this line of work? Yeah, I mean, I never started uh, thinking. Uh, I guess okay, my career is longer, so I can think about it. Uh, I can answer first, maybe. <laughs> but I mean, uh, but but um, yeah, I never thought I would. Uh, never had this idea that festivals would be my perfect uh, point of uh, uh, this perfect sort of project that I would aspire to do. Fifteen or twenty years, whatever, after my PhD. Um, you acquire skills, you acquire competencies, you acquire CV, and then that puts you in a position to, to look for opportunities. You know, my research has always been about cultural consumption. Um, my research has always been about um, how people, um, um, the types of socialities people have uh, amongst each other uh, with, or with each other and the meanings of those types of interactions they have. It's also been about the ways in which objects create certain environments for social action it's pretty pretty abstract academic stuff, but it's always got an attention to what people what people are actually doing through through talking to them, through interviewing them, interviewing them, or through observing them, and so on. So, um, uh, but you, I, your, your research also is uh, like music has been a, a constant theme. Rec- there. Recently, not not so much. I mean, uh, in the first maybe ten or fifteen, ten, twelve years of my my uh, career, I always had an interest in music, but I but I didn't want to study music because I was also trying to address. Um, more broad theoretical questions, or more, um, yeah, more broad, more more broad um, field theoretical questions. So I shied away from studying music, but then I had built built a certain type of um, credibility around studying materiality, a certain type of credibility around studying spaces of social interaction and social mixing through studies about cosmopolitanism and through studies around material culture, and then then I thought. Like I devoted a certain amount of my career to all of the strict things you need to do as an academic. And I thought, yeah, I could write a book about vinyl records. Mm-hmm. I could write a book about small record labels. I could run a project about festivals. <laughs> so it sort of, I don't know, it developed organically. Mm-hmm. And there are also opportunities. I mean, um, part of, the, part of the, the story here is that um, funding bodies also want researchers to study real social spaces. And so, um, or in, in our case, real social spaces. So festivals are an important social space that, that's a recognition. Well, well I, I don't work for the commune, but I know that the, the, the communes around Denmark put in a lot of money to, to funding culture. Uh, exactly. A, a lot of money to, to fund festivals. And, you know, they, they, they want the people that live there to stay there. They want them to have a good time. They want, they want them, yeah. the, the, the government want people to enjoy themselves yeah. they want the it's money about quality, to circulate. Of quality of life quality of public life and all these sorts of things there's many reasons politi- politically why you would fund yeah. a festival for, for other people correct so so, so it, uh, it it affects a lot of people and there's a lot of people involved in the music festivals exactly what about yourself Sina? What, what was your, <laughs> well, how did you get into this well i would i think the short answer would be that ian got me into this mm-hmm. um as he already said he's the lead of the project and he won these money for festivals but my interest, of course, in participating uh, resides in my more general interest in studying everyday life to some sense. Uh, my previous project have focused on everyday life um, and also material interactions in everyday life, spaces, how they're made up. 
Uh, so through my time as a student, I have studied uh, feeling at home in dormitories in the U.S. In the U.S.? In the U.S. And I Where had, I guess you were living at the time. Yes, I had a semester for the purpose of studying it. Mm -hmm. And uh, most recently before this project, I studied the use of the menstrual cup and other everyday uh, technology and material interaction. And then festival, I mean, I know it's not an everyday interaction in the sense that it only happens once a year. But then on the other hand, how many people do you know that have never attended a festival? It's such a common thing, whether it's be an Asparagus festival or a music festival, mm -hmm. a local festival or something that you travel for. Uh, so that was really what was, kind of became my entry point and interest in this project. Something so common, like why is it that... This is something we're so commonly uh, um, fascinated and willing to participate in and keep on participating in. Do you have an answer to that question? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. But I think definitely, as we've already discussed this year, in a sense it's a privilege, and this by no means should sound like I appraise the situation that we're in. But in a sense it's a privilege to actually, when you're trying to study the importance of something, mm then it's actually a privilege to then see, okay, what happens when it's lost? Mm -hmm. when, it, when it just is taken away from you. And then, of course, as we have seen so far, they don't just get lost. Mm -hmm. uh, new things aspire. Um, so in that sense, at least what we can conclude for now is that they, they keep on being important. Well, I, I, I guess, as Johnny Mitchell says, you don't know what you got till it's gone. Uh, <laughs> you know, people uh, just take it for granted, maybe that okay, the festival's going to come back around, but yeah. then it, whenever it's cancelled, it's wow, I actually, I actually really, really miss that festival. And that's also where we see a lot of people actually wanting to support the festival. Mm -hmm. And we just uh, when we picked up the second beer, we talked about these bracelets that both Ian and I am, are wearing, support bracelets. Um, mm. Uh, that Turner, Festi Turner Festival, for instance, have produced. You buy a support bracelet for 100 kroner. It looks like a regular festival bracelet, mm. um, but you're supporting the festival. And when you're walking down the streets of Turner, you're also showing others that you're supporting the festival. Mm. And many festivals have taken this opportunity. And even more interesting, also, the, the festival have, have requested it. Can you make a merchandise? Can you make us more merchandise so we can buy it? Or mm. I've seen people from Smokefest asking, do you have the 2020 tents? I want to buy a tent from you guys, the tents that they usually put up for their audiences. Yeah. So people have really been requesting, in what ways can we support you guys? Uh, and of course the festivals, I think the most, some of them have been producing these different types of merchandise or opportunities for support, like the festival bracelet. Um, but then also, of course, a way of supporting the festivals have been to transfer your ticket for next year, not asking for a refund, mm -hmm. uh, keeping the capital for these festivals, but, mm. but it's been a really strong move like that. Well, well yeah, so some of the festivals, they, if they re refund everything, they're, they're, the festival will not come back again next year. Yeah, so it makes me think that then in a, in a way what we're really studying is the sort of the, the responses of communities to this type of um, uh, COVID trauma in a way, right? This sort of, um, this, this, widespread, um, this rides, widespread feeling of loss, but could translate as a type of social trauma. And what we're really looking at then is how people adapt in resilient ways, how they keep their communities together, how they keep their families together through the festival as a way of, as a way of being, I guess, as a way of being social. So really, this is, this is in essence, is, is how the, the um, study has changed this year, is that we're really looking at the, the way in which people keep stuff alive, how they keep their, their social lives and their community lives happening. And the festival becomes a sort of an important vehicle for that important way of, um, of continuing it and, and making it happen mm -hmm. yeah I'm, yeah. I'm to, curious to read the results the conclusions and yeah the I mean you're going <laughs> to follow our website they will come. if yeah. you want uh, yeah. or Twitter I think we're quite we're probably more yeah, active on Twitter even. Is, the, the website is good and we'll continue with blogs and so on there are blog entries that we that both advertise through Twitter mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Ian and Cena Thank yeah. you very much for joining me on the Science yeah. of Beers podcast. Cheers. One last cheers. Skull. To, Skull. Cheers to that. Skull. Thanks. <laughs> Pleasure. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Science of Beers podcast. I hope you've been inspired to create your own at-home festival until the festivals are back in action again. If you want to follow the progress of the Festiversities project, you can do that on Twitter 
at Festiversities. I'll put a link in the description of this podcast, along with a link to Zena and Ian's uh, Twitter handles. If you like this podcast, if you're enjoying the podcast, please consider uh, telling a friend about it. Please consider writing a, a positive review about it. You can also support our Kiss Mayor Beer Fund at patreon.com forward slash science and beers. Thank you very much.